I didn't have to say anything else. The stallion turned tail and ran. Following the trail left behind by Sapphire and the rest of her rangers who got away before. Once he was gone, I turned back towards the Shadow Talons, my friends, the Bitter Cobb, which has already landed. All of them were looking at me like I was Aquila, like I wasn't the friend they thought I was last week. They were right to think that, because I too knew deep down I wasn't the same pony I was before. I fell into a dark place deep in my own mind. I could even go after all of them, maybe even kill Sapphire. But I knew I couldn't. Not right now. They'd stay away for now. They might try to get help from other Steel Rangers, but luckily for me, that wouldn't be a problem for a while. The only other Rangers around here in Los Alicorn, and, uh, and Sapphire didn't trust them. San Francisco was also too far away, and any others would spend weeks of travel before getting here. Sapphire was alone for the time being. <clears throat> Shadow, are you okay? Stardust asked as I walked past Noodle Cup's bloody remains. He'd gotten Wind Thrasher a little ways away from where I'd killed Noodle Cup. I only had him move her just in case Dreamwalker decided to use his little trick and blow up the last bullet. I just wanted my friend to be safe. From what I saw, she wasn't getting any better with her fight against the bloodlust. Right now, it was a race to who would lose themselves first. Wind Thrasher to Bloodlust or me to Aquila. So I took in a deep breath and did my best to put on a calm face. I'll be fine, Stardust. I had to make sure they didn't come back. How's Wind Thrasher? Is she going to be okay? I asked as I trotted over to them. He looked down at her, still worried. She has good days and bad. Dr. Gauze is close to what she needs, but he needs a few more days. She's holding out as best she can. But she's slowly losing herself. I reached out to hug him, then stopped at the side of my bloody hoof and pulled it back. We'll help her. Don't worry, Stardust. I saw something strange in his eyes as he looked down at her. He sniffed, then said quietly, I can't lose anybody else I care about. I know, and we'll get her the help she needs. Come on, let's get you both out of here. I said, then looked at the Shadow Talons, Aura, Solstice, and Captain Gunny and his crew. I think it's time we say goodbye, Gunny. Thanks for helping me get home. Sunspot came closer, saying, Shadow, we promised to get you all the way to New Pegasus. We haven't done that yet. We're still not even in freedom yet. We have to complete our job, and we can't do that yet. Not until you're at least in freedom. Sonny be right in an all shadow. Ye still be under contract with the bitter cob till Gunny be getting ye home. Gunny said with a wicked smile. I'm close enough. It'll only take a few hours on hoof, Gunny. I said. V closed her throat. Shadow, you've been gone for a while now. There's more than steel rangers to worry about right now. Ponies think you're dead. The roads aren't safe for you right now. Knights... Even worse, I'll send the Shadow Talents to escort you to the base. Then you can send your ship friends off, she said as she looked around. Either way, where's Aura? I'm here, sis, Aura said, giving a half-hearted smile as V and Fletch both looked at her in confusion. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny, whoever you are, but my sister's a griffin, Fletch said. Shut up, Fletch, before I crack your beak. Again. Aura said, rolling her eyes. V on the other hoof looked shocked. That can't be you. What happened? Elliot answered. Killing joke. When we were in the Everfree. We can fill you on on the way back to freedom. Aura stood as tall as her pony body would allow, then looked at the Shadow Talons. Pony or Griffin, I'm still the leader of this talent company, and right now we're exposed. Some of us are injured. I want half of you to go scout the area and make sure the Unchained Talons aren't around, or the Romans. The rest of you will keep the Bitter Cow protected as we make our way to freedom. They all looked at her for a long moment, as if they couldn't understand what this pony was saying or doing. Then V stamped her talent on the ground, yelling, Yeah, I heard our leader. Move out! They were in the air in seconds. 
Half of them flew off in all directions, and the rest made a large circle over where the bitter cob would be when we took off again. Once that was done, Stardust put Wind Thrasher on his back and carried her onto the ship. Fletch, V, Aura, and the crew followed. I hadn't moved yet. Solstice came over to me and gently put a hoof on my shoulder. Hey, let's get you into the ship and get you cleaned up. I just looked down at my bloody hooves, at the gore around me, the dead rangers, what was left of Noodle Cup, and sighed. Is this all my life's going to be from now on? Death, destruction, anger, and pain? Ignoring my blood-covered body, Solstice hugged me, saying quietly, Only if you let yourself keep thinking like that. Now, stop worrying about what you did in the past and start looking forward. If you want a better future, you need to start changing things. There'll be more death, more pain, and more anger in the future. Sooner or later, things will look better. I'm not sure anymore, but I'll try, I said. Good. Now come on, let's get home, Solstice said, and with that, I let her lead me up to the ship. As the bitter cob took off and headed towards freedom, Aura started to tell her sisters about what happened while we were in the back seat. Solstice took me to the cabin and slowly peeled off my bloody clothes. Sunspot brought in some slightly dirty water and a rag and then took my barding to clean them as on the deck as Solstice started to clean me off. She was gentle as she used the rag to get the blood off my face, neck, hooves, and even my horn. As she worked, she started to hum a little tune to herself, letting me just process everything that happened in the past hour. In the past week, more. And as she hummed, I realized I knew the tune she was humming. It was the same song Mom told me about from the Crystal Empire. The words came back to me as she worked, and I started to think of them as I heard my mom do while we were in the San Polinmo Gorge. Solstice noticed what I was doing and looked in my eyes and gave me a small smile, then matched her humming as I continued. I stopped and thought for a moment, not knowing all of the rhyme or song or whatever it was, but then we continued. She stopped a little with a little smile, looking a bit embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't know you knew how that rhyme. My mom told me about it when we were stuck down in the gorge. I don't really understand it all. She said it was outlawed by the Enclave years ago, I said. Yeah, but do you know why? She asked. I shook my head. No, she didn't tell me. It's because 50 years ago, the Crystal Empire rebelled against the Enclave. The Crystal Empire wanted to be a free nation again. They wanted to be a better world for unicorns, earth ponies, and pegasi. That was the song they would sing when they would gather. It's all about the oppression the Crystal Empire had seen over the years between King Sombra and the Enclave. When the rebels lost, the song was outlawed. And now and then you catch a few ponies still saying it when they think the Enclave ponies aren't around. She said, continuing to clean me off. How do you know it then? I asked. She shrugged. I don't know the whole thing. There are just three verses before you, where you started. I've only heard parts of it because my mom taught it to me. How did she know it? I asked. My grandmother was a spy for the rebels during those times. She worked close with the rebel leader. Her name was Fallen Star. Your grandmother, I believe. Solstice said with a smile. I guess our families were always meant to keep finding each other, huh? I'm surprised you're here, then, if your grandmother was part of the rebels. I said. She wouldn't have been if she hadn't crossed covered her tracks when the rebels started to fall. In the end, she betrayed them to keep her family safe. At least that's what my mom says. Fallen Star was almost executed too, but thanks to my grandmother, she was given a deal to save her skin. Solstice said. What deal was that? I asked. I don't know. My mom knows more than I do. All I do know is that it had something to do with turning in some rebels or something like that. She said as she finished with my horn, then threw the filthy rag into the bucket of red and brown water. I wonder if that's why my grandmother looks so wretched in all those memories of my mom's, I said. She looked like a pony who'd lost everything. Yeah, probably. You shouldn't care too much about what Fallen Star did during the time. Last I heard, she was an angry old mare living in a hut. 
Some pony even say she's mad, Solstice said. Now, come on, lay down for a bit until we're ready to land, all right? I just nodded and left Solstice, let me down. Then she gave me the pill to help my magic, then put the vial of sleep potion down next to me. I looked at it, confused at why she'd put it there. We'll be home soon. Why do you want me to sleep? She just smiled and said, Because you need it. Don't worry. When we wake up, or when you'll be in a bed in the Shadow Talons base. Or I'll wake you. Only we'll drink a quarter of the potion. You only need a couple of hours. For a moment, I didn't want to sleep. But I knew she was right, and I trusted her. So I took a sip, then gave the rest of the potion back to her. Thank you. No problem, Shadow. Now rest up, and I'll see you in a bit. She said, walking out of the room. I woke to found myself in a large, slightly moldy-smelling bed in a dark room. At first, I wasn't sure what woke me. I felt around the bed I was in, but felt no pony. Then I heard voices come from just outside my door. The one who was speaking sounded like Aura's. Even with the change it had to being a pony, I knew it was her. Like I said, I don't understand why we need to rush this, Grim. She's been through hell and back in the past week. She needs some rest. She needs to get her strength back. You said yourself that when you checked her, Aquila felt weak inside. She said, sounding upset. Then I heard Mom. I agree that she does need rest, and Aquila is in fact weak inside of her. But still, we have no idea if it's a ruse or not. Aquila is old and crafty. She could be trying to make us think she's weak until we let our guard down. Also, the plan's almost ready and set. We can't wait too much longer. If we do, everything will be ruined. I still don't understand why you're trusting her still. She says she believes Shadow now, but she could just be tricking us, I heard Stardust say. You don't have much of a choice anymore, Stardust, Mom said. I am the only pony left that can do anything to help her. That's what both of you told me after Shadow was taken over. I'm on your side now. You need to trust me, please. I heard Aura sigh. I have no choice but to trust you. I just don't like this plan of yours. Why can't we do this here? Why do we need her to go all the way to Lost Alicorn? She needs to go to the lab in the Ministry. It's the only way I can do this. My friend there can help make sure the spell goes right. She's the only one who knows how my magic works and understands zebra spells as much as I do. Mom said. Let's continue this conversation in the council room. I don't want to wake Shadow. Aura said. Good idea. Stardust replied with a sigh. I'll meet you all down there. I'm going to go check on Wind Thresher first. All right, but don't take too long. Sunspot and her crew will be leaving soon, and we'll have company. We need to get this plan ready before Shadow gets up, Nora said. Guess some things never change, do they, Star? A voice in the darkness said behind me, almost making me jump until I realized it was my uncle's. I turned to see his purple eyes glowing in the d little of the darkness. I smiled a little, saying quietly, Hey, Uncle Ori, it's so good to see you again. He came closer, and his shadowy form changed into the golden pony I was used to. He sat next to the bed and leaned down to hug me. I'm so happy that you made it back here safe and sound. Safe, maybe. Sound, not so much. I said as I returned his embrace. You're here and alive. You know who you are, and your power is mostly intact. I couldn't ask for more after what I saw you going through in that cage. He said, still holding me close. I could feel a slight warmth coming off of him. It was odd because normally Ori Kalos gave off a cold aura, a side effect of shadowy magic. You feel... different, Uncle Ori, I said once he began to pull away. He smiled a little. Ever since I was forced out of your mind by Aquila, I have felt different. It's like a bit of my old self is trying to make its way through the darkness around my soul. Though my shadow magic has been a little weaker because of it. I smiled at that. That's not a bad thing. Maybe that spark of light inside you is growing brighter. Who knows? 
Maybe one day you'll be able to get your old body back. <laughs> Let's not get our hopes up. But your mother thinks it possible. Even she's been doing a lot better since she watched those orbs you gave her. I think she's finally starting to believe us about the memory problems and what she thinks is real. He said. I'm glad to hear that. I said, then looked down at the blanket covering me. Has she remembered anything yet? He shook his head. No. But she does have moments where she starts getting angry and reverting back to her old self. The cloak part of her, I mean. But she tries her best. She'll be happy to see you up, though. She's been wanting to talk with you ever since she left that last memory. Or I also showed her other memories you had in your saddlebags while you were gone, from what I was told. At least she's not trying to kill me anymore. I said, then looked back at him. Oh yeah, what about the sins? Have we heard anything about them? Not much. Thundercracker came back yesterday and told us he had last spotted them, heading towards a settlement near Los Alicorn, but that he lost track of them. Lori Callis said. Figures. Well, at least he's okay, I said. He almost died twice because of that new wrath. That stallion is sneaky, and a good shot, he said with a sigh. <laughs> I wish I found him years ago. I just rolled my eyes. Please don't bring up your old team. Sorry, sorry. But hell, he's a good sniper. Even if it wasn't what I am now... And still up in the military, in Nimbus, I'd still want him. I wish I knew who he was. It helped me understand why he's such a good shot, he said with a chuckle. Anyway, do you think you're up for going downstairs? Yeah, my body's a little tired and sore, but I can manage it, I said, slowly getting out of bed. Hey, why do we have to go to Los Holocorn? He laughed. I knew you were listening to them. Well, whatever your mother is planning to get Aquila out, it needs to be done there. I can't say more, though. Yeah, I know. This bitch in my head will try to stop it, I said, rolling my eyes. I'll just have to trust her. Not an easy thing to do, I'm sure, he said as he followed me to the door. I had to trust her to not kill me while we were stuck in the gorge. This isn't much different, I said. <laughs> I guess you're right. Lori Callis replied as he pushed open the door and started to lead me back down the dim hallway. So, what's been going on with Windthrasher? She kind of lost her while we were fighting the Steel Rangers. She's having a harder and harder time keeping the bloodlust away, he said as we walked down the hall. I thought Dr. Gauze would have found a fix for her by now, I said. He thinks he knows what to do. He found what the problem is and why it's getting harder for her to control, but... Still hasn't been able to synthesize a cure, though he says he's almost done. Lori Callis said as we reached a large set of stairs. What's causing her to act like this? I asked. My uncle used to be a scientist, and I could tell now that his eyes lit up as he started to explain. Well, Windthrush's DNA is mixed with two very powerful creatures. Both of them have strong insect instincts to feed, and both are hard to control. When she was in Stable 9, she was given a shot every month by Dr. Cell to keep those urges back. It was a temporary suppressant, keeping her DNA bonded properly, and keeping her pony mind in control of the mutations. If he hadn't done this, even the collar he had on her would have failed. From what she said, he never found a way to fix the problem for good, either because he didn't want to, or because he didn't have the need in the stable. It has been weeks since she got her last shot, and even if she doesn't know what was in it to keep her mind from going feral. So her body is slowly turning into the monster she fears. When she's angry or very hungry or even upset, it gets harder for her to control herself. So she needs this suppressant to be her normal self. One that sticks the rest of her life, right? I asked. He nodded. Yeah. I just hope that during this time, we're awaiting the cure, her DNA doesn't get too unstable. If the ionic bonds holding the three types together get unstable, she could literally just melt into a puddle or pile of some sort. Dr. Goss hasn't found a way to make that happen yet? I asked. We just reached the bottom of the stairs that led to the large reception area. Large glass doors and windows showing us a dark nighttime in the wasteland, and the lights of freedom on the strip not far off. 
Standing there, looking up at me, with tired-looking eyes, was Windthresher. I stopped at the bottom of the steps as she glared at me with her slightly glowing yellow eyes. For a moment, I thought she was going to yell at me, or maybe kill me like she had in the other world. But after a moment, she just blinked and smiled a little. Then she said, Dr. Gaz did find one way to fix me for good, but I told him no. That caught me off guard, both her answer and the fact that she wasn't trying to bite my head off. Why would you do that? I noticed then that Stardust was standing next to the desk a few feet back, watching us with tired eyes of his, just as tired as Windthresher's. Then my gaze was pulled back to her as she said, Because the cure he found first would most likely destroy my ability to reproduce. She blushed a little, and I noticed her gaze move towards Stardust. I won't let that happen, unless it's the only way. I tilted my head to the side. Wait, you can have foals? Even at your age? Also, do you lay eggs because of the dragon part of you? I knew I said something extremely stupid when her eyes flickered to red and back to yellow. She growled a little, as I, she said through grit teeth. How old do you think I am, Shadow? I tried to do some math in my head, then realized I really had no idea. All she ever told me about herself was before she was a bat pony, she was young when she was hurt. So I lowered my ears as I said, Um, thirty-three or two, I don't know. <laughs> Stardust, to my surprise, answered, saying, If you'd taken the time to ask her more about herself, you'd know that she was barely eight when she was turned into what she is now. Do the math and you'll get it. I face hoofed. Sorry, I didn't even think to ask about your age or anything like that with Thresher. Still, it's not like I know much about foals and how old you can be before you can't have one anymore. My uncle laughed. Didn't they teach you health class in your stable? If you mean the one where they put a condom over a vegetable, then yes. Then I decided that the teacher was creepy and old and smelled like mothballs, so I took a nap in the back of the room. I said with a huff. It's not like they had any good stuff to look at anyway. Windthrasher started to laugh. That explains so much. What? You had to be too young to get that class before Stable 9 was sealed. What do you know about it? I asked. I read every book I could get my hands on in the stable at least six times. I didn't need the class, she said with a laugh, and finally she came over to me and pulled me into a tight hug. For a moment, I thought she'd forgive me for what I did, the lies I told and everything. Then her muzzle came close to my ear as she said, If you ever lie to me again like that, or try to kill yourself, or keep any secrets like you did, I'll make you hurt in more ways than one. You have no idea how painful it was for me or the rest of us, when we heard that shot go off. We're a family, and we stick together. Do you understand me, Shadow? I did my best to hold back tears as I said, Yeah, I understand. Good, she said, then pulled away, giving me a smile. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Yes, I can have foals even at my age. And now, with the body I'm in with... Dr. Cell wanted to make sure that I could breed one day. He also wanted to keep some of the others alive in the stable so he could test that out. But his plans didn't work. Also, no, I don't lay eggs. Do I look like a bird to you? I'm only asking because you seem to think that I look like an old lady. You mean he would have forced you to do that? That's disgusting. Oh, about the old thing? How many times do I have to apologize? I said tell me about it. I was lucky he didn't try anything with me the whole time we were stuck in that stable, she said with a shiver, ignoring my question. I don't think I could have recovered from that. Yeah, I agree. Good thing he's dead, huh? I said. Yeah, very good thing, Windthrasher said, then looked over at my uncle. Grim said she needs you to get things ready. We'll be leaving in a couple of hours. So soon? Ori Callus asked. She nodded. Yeah, Grim says she's ready and we can't waste any more time. Then she looked over at Stardust. Can you make sure everything's ready to go with the sky carriage? He yawned and nodded. 
I guess. You going to be okay while I'm gone? Rith Rusher nodded. I will be. I took more of that potion Dr. Gaz gave me, and I'm feeling a lot better. Okay. He said, then came over to pull me into a hug. I'm so happy you're alive, Shadow. You have no idea how hard it's been without you. I hugged him back, feeling a couple tears falling from my eyes. I miss you too, Stardust. Happy to be back. Also, you could really use a shower. He pulled away and smiled down at me. You know, so could you. You smell like stagnant water and a musty rag. Anyway, we'll talk tonight once we head out. I want to know everything that's happened. All right? I nodded. No problem. I said, trying not to say anything on the settings. With that, he flew down the hallway that led deeper into the building. Once he was gone, uh, my uncle said, I'll go get things set up too. I'll see you in a couple of hours, Star. All right, Uncle Ori, I said as he shifted into shadows. Now it was just me and Wind Thrasher. She gave me her creepy smile, showing all of her fangs as she said, Let's go see if Grim's ready for you. Lead the way, I said as we started down the hall, the furthest hall from the reception desk. As we walked, I started seeing griffins going from room to room, some passing us in the halls, others teaching younger griffins in what looked like a makeshift classroom. Every single one wore an armband or bandana with a symbol I hadn't seen before. Before I knew what it was, as soon as I saw it, the new mark of the Shadow Talons. While I was away, either Aura or his sisters or one of the other griffins must have designed it. I didn't know if I should feel honored or horrified at the mark, because it was my cutie mark. Mostly. My purple and black eight-pointed star was in the middle of an extended bright red and black griffin ring wings. On the star itself, where the two uh, crossed skeleton keys would be, there was instead two curved swords in its place. One was black, the other was right, white. Joy and misery crossed over my star of power, encircled by wings like auras. It was a symbol that said her and I were one, one family, and nothing could change that. The fabric the new symbol was on was an icy blue mixed with red, just like our eyes. I decided that I'd take it as an honor that these griffins wore it with pride, as much as they had with the red talons. Just like her distant grandmother before her, Aura had created something wonderful, something good, something powerful. The Shadow Talons would live on in history as one of the best talent companies ever to exist in the Wasteland. After a few minutes of passing by Griffins, we reached our destination. The large double doors opened to a massive conference room with an old oak table in the middle, reminding a lot of the room where my father met with the former High Council ponies in Minneapolis. More windows looked out towards the Strip and Freedom. The walls had an odd, old, weathered look to them, but apart from that, it was a nice place. On the furthest wall back, an old company name had been carved beautifully into the wood. It said F&F Tools, and under it, in small letters, it said Corporate Headquarters. So that's what this place was. Flapjack and Falafels, Corporate Headquarters. I thought the place I first met Watson would have been the place, but I guess I was wrong. Maybe Falafel just liked to use other buildings to get away from the stress of a building like this one, or to have his free time with Lily. Sitting at the table just under the FNF Tools emblem sat my mother. To her right, Aura was there, still stuck in a pony, but in a deep conversation with her. To my mother's left, none other than Violet sat there, her large body making the seat look small. On each side of Violet, I saw Aura. Uh, on Aura, I saw V and Sin. They all looked up as soon as the doors opened. Aura beamed at me as soon as she saw me. Good to see you're up. I was just filling them in on everything that happened. Yes, I'm quite surprised that you two survived your encounter with Killing Joke, Mom said. It's good to have you back here, Shadow. V looked as tired as she said. I took over Aura an hour to explain that she was our sister. I'm still finding it hard to believe. I walked in, Wind Thrasher following me. She wasn't the only one to get affected by the killing joke. Mom looked worried as she asked, What happened to you? 
I know Solstice is fine and all, but Aura didn't say anything about you. I sighed. I'll show you. I faced towards the windows, pulled my magic, and blasted it right at the window. Just like when I fought Sapphire, it came out as a rainbow blast of little light. I didn't do anything but look pretty. I can't use my most powerful spell. I thought I'd get looks of worry, or at least a sympathetic word or two. Nope. V started laughing along with Aura. Sin looked away while trying to hide her own amusement. Violet gave me a small smile, and Windthrasher was howling with utter glee behind me. Mom was the only one who didn't look amused. In fact, she looked worried. You may all think this is funny, but I assure you it's not. Killing Joke is a deadly plant for a reason. Shadow only knows three spells from what I've learned, and that's her only offensive one. She might have need of it in the future. Aura was laughing so hard she fell out of her seat. Violet just smiled wider as she said, I agree with you, Grim, but it is a little funny. I'm sure the joke will wear off after a while. Maybe, but if it doesn't, by the time we get to La Salacorn, I could throw off our plans, Mom said. Wait, what do you mean wears off? I thought Killy Joke lasted forever, I said. Mom just sighed. It does in most cases, or it just kills you. Every now and then, the spell they put on you can go away. Most of the time, that happens when the joke isn't funny anymore, or deadly. Yours is funny, even I can admit that, but it's not deadly to you. I've seen you fight, hell I've fought you, and you don't need that one spell as much as that plant might have thought. Try using it to blind an enemy or something like that, and I'm sure the spell will go away. The joke not being funny anymore. You see? I guess that's right. But what about Aura? I said. Aura gave me a wink. What? You don't like me like this? I love you how I met you. I mean, yes, if you were stuck like that, I'd be okay with it because it's still you. It's just that you deserve to be what you were born as. That's what you are. It's who you are, and I'm sure you can't run the Shadow Talons as a pony, I said. Aura sighed. That's true. There isn't much, but I can do about it yet. That is right, Violet said. But I've heard rumors that some ponies are looking into a cure. Laserite and Yaksha are looking into it. They left a couple of hours ago. If anyone can figure it out, it's those two. Wait, Yaksha's with laser light now? So I take it they found each other again, huh? What about Stryker? I asked. Mom's face went dark as she said, He's gone. He ran off once he heard Aquila was free. He's back on the path to kill you again. Even after I've sent him word that you're back to your old self and that I had plans to help you. Let me guess, he doesn't trust you? I asked. She nodded. He hasn't for years now, I guess. I don't know what happened when we last met. That memory wasn't in the orbs you gave me. But he hates me as much as he hates the Enclave. I think that's all Stryker has left in him. Hate. He lost everything in his life because of it. I said with a sigh. That he has. Mom said. She looked a little sad as she said. Most of it was because of me. I looked at her in shock. What he did wasn't your fault, Mom. She gave me a little smile. Everyone was quiet, letting us talk, something I hadn't been able to do with her for eight years. She took a moment, as if she was deep in thought, then finally said, When I first met Stryker all those years ago, I only started dating him because I was already looking into ponies from the war. I wanted to find them, to see if any of them could be of help to the Crystal Empire to help it free itself from the Enclave. You see, Shadow, I've never been loyal to them. Even when I went back to them, I became Cloak. I spent most of my adult life trying to destroy them and free my home. Our home, I guess, from that power. You wanted to start another rebellion? I heard Sin say. You know about the last one? Mom asked. Yeah, heard about it from Tonto when I was little. He said a few of the rebels managed to escape, and he made met them when they were younger. Sin replied. Mom smiled a little. Well, yes. I did, and still do want to start a rebellion. She turned her focus back to me. You see, my mother was one of the leaders of the last one fifty years ago. She lost against the Enclave, but she did tell us stories about it when we were little. Whenever my father wasn't around, that is. 
I thought your parents were monsters. I said with a frown. My father, yes. He was an evil pony with too much rage and a drinking problem, among other things. My mother wasn't much better. But she had her good days. I can't say that I ever liked my mother, but I still loved her. Still do. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. She was part of the reason I wanted to start my own. I knew that she was right to try and free us from the Enclave, so I started looking into what I could do to give the Crystal Empire a boost in power. And that's why I started seeing Stryker, Mom said, looking sad. I didn't intend to fall in love with him. I only wanted to use him to find what he knew about his family, what they had been hiding. So you've been looking for falling shadows ever since I was born? I asked. She shook her head. No, not at all. I didn't even know about it, apart from a few things mentioned about the project I found in my grandmother's notes in the Forgotten Library. I was looking for other projects that Stryker's family helped develop during the war. I found things about the Children of the Night because of my research. Later, I started asking Stryker about them and getting intel every time. Then I found intel on Solar Flare and went looking for it. Wait, what? I asked, shocked at that. She smiled. Yes, the same weapon you used to destroy Appleton is the one I was trying to find. I looked for a year, trying to find the rangefinder, the object I knew I needed to make it work. Sadly, during that time, I fell for Stryker, and my search started to slow. I started to see what it was like to be a pony in the upper echelon of the Enclave. My thoughts started. Starting rebellion almost died there and then. Then Stryker left me and broke my heart. And I think he figured out sometime later after I started seeing Nightshade, that I was using him. And that's why he hates me, I think. Though I think it was because I was looking for falling shadows. I saw in one of your memories that you hid the rangefinder. It wasn't long after that that you met with Elder Wolfsbane, I said. Yeah, and that's because I found it sometime later while I was trying to heal you. She paused for a moment, then shook her head. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to find it hard to keep it in mind that you are who you say you are. Every now and then my mind seems to go blank and the memories I've picked up about you as of late are trying to pull away from me. I looked over at Aura. Did you show her those notes Sheena gave us? Oh, I'd almost forgot about that. I've been busy ever since we got back. She said, pulling the notebook Sheena gave us out of her new looking set of saddlebags. Huh, I wonder where she got those at. She gave them to my mom. And Prashina started looking at your memory problem while Shadow was stuck in a memory crystal. I told her about what Squirrel and Moose discovered about that rock, and she agrees with them that it might not have been the thing that messed with your mind. She looked at the notebook and started flipping through it with her magic. We all waited while she read through the notes, her face looking more and more concerned. After a little while, she finally looked up, saying, which makes a lot of sense. I've known for some time now that my use of zebra magic mixed with my own was doing something to my body. She indicated her gray mane with one silver streak still in it. As she talked, I remembered another thing I had heard Aquila say to her in one of her memory orbs. Aquila told you in the stable that your body was weak or dying or something like that because of the magic you used. She furrowed her brow. I have no memories after I've left the stable apart from the one you made me remember somehow. But I can't disagree with the statement that monster said, she said. In the past, memories, I'm sure, are true, and not the ones my mind tried to replace. I could tell my body was aging faster than it should, or parts of my body were having problems. The first signs of this, I believe, was my problem having a foal. Later, my mane turning gray after using more powerful spells. And then there were times where I felt like an old pony and couldn't get myself out of bed. I never thought it was messing with my memories. Do you remember what happened that day you fought Hex? I asked. Not a lot, but I do remember something going wrong with the spell. It was right when he pulled out that stone. Something snapped inside of me. I can't say what it was, but I felt it in my mind. Something exploded, and the rest is just gone. After I woke up some time later, I couldn't remember most of what happened to me over the past ten years. I had bits and pieces of it, but not everything, she said. Is that when you started thinking I was dead and you saw me die? I asked. No. For a couple of days, I 
Didn't even know what year it was. Not until I found Oricalus again. He told me the lies I told him, I guess. And my mind filled with the rest in. She looked sad. Looking back at how I acted, I turned into quite a horrible pony. It's not your fault you didn't know, I said. I may not have known, but from what I'm reading now, I can see it's quite possible that the memory loss was my own fault. My quest to become more powerful is the reason my body and mind are failing. I saw the signs years ago, but I didn't do anything about it. I just kept on going, ignoring what I was doing to myself, ignoring the evidence I had in front of me about you and more, she said. The important thing is that you're here now, helping us, I heard a voice say from the doorway. I turned around and saw Vervain standing there, with a newer suit of power armor and the helmet off. She looked a little older since the last time I saw her, which I realized was only a couple weeks ago. A little gray was starting to show in her mane, and her eyes looked tired. A few more lines showing in her muzzle and neck. But she still gave me the bright smile as her eyes met, and I ran over to hug her tight, ignoring the metal suit she was in. 